Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I'm your host, Scott Ramp, and I'm here to talk about all sorts of things that are happening in the city of Missoula. I got Susan Campbell Renault on he on here today to talk about the Memorial Day uh, ceremonies that are going to be happening, not this Monday, but a week from this Monday, um, and she'll have more about that later in the show. I got some news. I got Flagship Friday. I got uh, a bunch of city council committee meetings uh, for your city council report. So let's kick things off with a little bit of weather. The flood warning continues on until Saturday at noon. Uh, today, you have highs into the 60s, lows in the 40s. You have that 60 to 40% chances of rains and showers. Uh, but by, su by uh, Saturday night, it's going to be mostly cloudy. It's going to be mostly sunny by Sunday with 20% chance of thunderstorms. And then by Sunday and then Sunday night, it will be... Uh, a transitional thing so it seems like there's going to be a a, a a small thunderstorm storm front happening sunday night sunday um so just kind of look out for that but it looks like saturday seems like it might be a, a fairly better day uh to go out and about those days maybe check out for some farmers market but i'll have that and events more later on in the show so let's talk about things that are happening here uh big sky student uh was basically uh kind of uh suspended from school uh, for wearing a Confederate flag uh, sweater. Um, freedom of expression is one of the many ways uh, this youngster can come about protecting his rights to wear this kind of clothing. But in the sense of school rules, anything that could be considered disruptive to the school curriculum is usually punishable regardless of the expression. So Michael Ballas, 17, um, he said he was wearing a sweatshirt to stand up for students' First Amendment right to freedom of speech after one of his friends at Big Sky was asked not to wear a Confederate flag hat. Uh, Ballas brought a sweatshirt and began wearing it to school every day. And as a result, the first time they told him to take it off, he took it off. Second time, told him to take it off. And then uh, by the third time, they did they gave him two detentions. And then next the next week after, um, He's wearing this, a sweatshirt as well, and then that's when the suspension started, which caused quite a stir around the uh, school system as well, of course. School uh, policy states that if a student's behavior or its ramification constitutes a disruption of the learning environment, administrators, administrations, administrators reserve the right to discipline students who threaten or harass their classmates regardless of where or how the specific behavior occurs. Uh, to balance wearing the sweatshirt is a way of supporting his peers who have been told not to wear Confederate insignia. Um, he says, a strong man stands up for himself, a stronger man stands up for others, and I'm standing up for others and their rights. The Confederate flag display is similar to the student wearing a shirt covered in marijuana plants or sexually explicit language. Some administrators determine disruption and they act not out of ideology, but the interest of the care and well-being of students. In state news, while flooding in areas uh, is a potential outbreak for many diseases, um, are possible when water comes into contact with the sewer water. And again, to skin contact for those volunteers helping with the uh, Helena uh, flooding efforts and maybe even around here as well, uh, there's uh, free, net, free tetanus shots happening in Helena. Um, and immunization will be provided from 9 a.m. to noon uh, today at the health department 1930 9th Avenue being up to date on the tetanus or va other vaccination is one of the most important ways to lower your risk of getting sick so nothing uh, so the clinic is available for homeowners workers and volunteers who are sandbagging or are otherwise in contact with the flood water so you can check that out and it's happening all day today at Helena in national news, the first woman CIA director was sworn in the other day. Director Gina Haspel, in addition to being CIA's first female director, has also been the first member in a long time to actually worked, have worked for the CIA since the 1970s, um, William Colby. Uh, she's 61 years old and is widely respected in the intelligence community. Since joining the CIA in 1985, just a few years out of college, she has some 20 jobs in the agencies, including seven posting abroad. While she ran a black ops site prison in Thailand, where officers carried out waterboarding and other harsh tactics to extract information from suspected Al-Qaeda mil militants, uh, the other was in 2005 when she was based in the CIA, CIA headquarters outside Washington and wrote a cable calling for videotapes of the waterboardings to be destroyed. In several shop exchanges with the senators, hospital said she would not initiate any new detention and inter uh, interrogation programs as CIA director, but she will not disavow the previous program which ran from 2002 to 2008. In a letter on Monday, she went beyond what she said in the public testimony and stated, with the benefit of hindsight and my experience as a senior agent leader, 
and enhanced interrogation program is not one of the CIA should have undertaken. She wrote in a letter to Senator Mark uh, Warner, a Democrat from Virginia, vice chairman of the Intelligence Committee in the Senate. She won the Senate vote 54 to 45 in favor of Haspel, uh, came mostly along party lines. So that's uh, more information on that. If you go to NPR.org, you can also go to Missoulian and the Helena Independent Report to find out, record, sorry, to find out more information about all these news items. But I'm going to stop keeping Susan Renault waiting, and I got a new art clip for you guys. So when I come back, I'll have Susan Renault on here to talk about Memorial Day weekend. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. I'm here with Susan Campbell Renault, and she's here to talk about uh, Memorial Day ceremonies that are happening. Um, I believe it's May 26. No, no, May 28. May 28. That's it's Monday. It's usually the last Monday in May. It is. And it's to uh, it's to um, basically uh, remember all that all the people that we've lost in our lives, basically. No, it's the people who have died in service to our nation. Okay. Not just people that have died. It is people that have served in the military who died in service to our nation. Hmm. I always thought that uh, Memorial Day was supposed to be kind of like America's, kind of like how they have um, Day of the Dead Parade and no. all that stuff. That's kind of like America's no. version of that to no. celebrate all the people that we've lost. Nope. It is to pay tribute to the people who died in service to our nation in uniform. Um, a lot of people morph it into celebrating and honoring people who have died in general, but it is to pay tribute to the people who served in the military. And we have expanded it to pay tribute to the people who served in the armed forces, but also for the police and also for firefighters. Right. So because we learned on September 11th, 2001 that our first line of defense against terrorism are our police and our firefighters. Right. So um, you, um, can you, t um, you interviewed with uh, Joel Baird on Monday's Missoula Live show. Is there anything yeah. you can tell me on this show that you didn't mention on his show? Well, number one, we have um, 51 wreath presentations that are going to be on Monday, the 28th of May. We want people to meet at uh, the first service is at sunrise at Western Montana State Veterans Cemetery. It will specifically pay tribute to the people, unfortunately, who could not handle their service in the military and committed suicide. So it will be a, um, a tribute to those people at Western Montana State Vet Veteran Cemetery at 6.30 a.m. Then we are going to be having a breakfast for um, anyone who wishes to come at the VFW Post 209 um, at 245 West Main Street. At 9.30 a.m., we start a procession that will go all over town, and we will be putting out 51 wreaths that will look, this is one of them, and um, that's why they're red, white, and blue, and they are to the first 
So the first uh, presentation is at Terrace Park at 10 a.m. And then we go to the um, uh, courthouse at approximately 1030. Then we go to the uh, military cemetery. We go to Western Montana State Veterans Cemetery again. We go to, and you can see all of that by emailing me, and it's on your wonderful right. website and also running on Joel's show and your show, um, Blue Mountain at Montana.com. Cool. And we are, we are going to be going all over to City Cemetery, uh, St. Mary's Cemetery, St. Mary's Cemetery Annex, and our big one is at Rose Park. Okay. We have honor and color guards from uh, Civil Air Patrol, VFW Post 209, American Legion, Knights of Columbus. And um, then we are going to end our entire day, which takes approximately seven hours to do all these wreath presentations. We're going to be at the University of Montana at the Iraq Afghanistan, where we have three Missoulians that died in combat and we'll be placing a wreath at their memorial and also at the beautiful memorial that was uh, placed over near Main Hall. Right. Okay. So um, it's happening on the 28th. On the on 28th of On May. Monday. And um, there's a bunch of uh, ceremonies happening pretty much all around the city of Missoula. Yes. If you want to uh, learn more about the kind of like the guidelines, the layout, the outline of all the ceremonies, because some people can't make them to all of them, but as many as you can, you can look at our website and our Facebook page, MCAT.org. Yes. You can go to uh, um, Missoula Community Media Resources, and I'll have something on my website as well. Yes. And... Memorial Day, unlike Veterans Day, is to pay tribute to the people who have died. Memorial Day is not a day to go shopping or to, to, to celebrate whoop de doo uh, For anybody that was in the military, as my father and my husband was, um, this is a day of remembrance. It's a very solemn day, and uh, it is a day to pay tribute to those who have died in uniform. All right. Well, thank you very much, Susan. Thank you. All right. Uh, we'll be right back right after this. And I Hi, everybody. Life. You know, life is busy. <laughs> well, I know. Like, I'm Dave Kendall, the chair of the Missoula County Democrats. Welcome to our forum on several... Uh, congressional uh, Montana State Legislative uh, seats this year, um, which are all in the Democratic primary. Uh, that'll be on um, June fifth. Thank you, thank you. June fifth. So that's the election we're headed for. We're very thankful we have so many outstanding candidates to hear from tonight. And, and the horse too. I can't stress enough how much the introduction of the horse changed um, Columbia Plateau and Plains Indian tribes, their behavior in terms of territory, expansion. They could go so many more places than they could before. So it really made a significant difference. And here's, you know, we tend to think of these trails in the woods, you know, going along or that tribal people were out there bushwhacking through the forest. Well, there were a really well-established network of trails. This is from the Salish and Ponderé and Kootenai people. But it, it wasn't, you know, and in the Lewis and Clark journals, they talk about this too. They always call the paths that they traveled roads because they were really well established. People had been following those same paths for centuries or thousands of years. Medicine that's injected, there's kind of an inter interesting story about it. It's uh, actually a chemotherapy drug that was developed to uh, f primarily treat colon cancer. And so when someone has cancer, one of the ways the tumor grows is by growing its own blood vessels. It needs an additional blood supply as it grows. If you can block that blood vessel growth, then you can slow down or stop the tumor growth. Um, it was discovered that that very substance, it was never developed for this, but if, if it's injected in the eye, it will stop this over-exuberant blood vessel growth in the eye. And it's, it's called Bevacizumab is the name of the, of the medicine, Avastin it's sometimes called. 
this is a video that uh, was taken by Bob Arnold. He's a pediatric ophthalmologist in Alaska. And, and so this shows briefly just the injection of some of this medicine in the eye. One of the nice things about it is that it's, it's a much quicker procedure. Instead of an hour placing 2,000 laser spots in the eye, this is over in about a minute. So he's putting a little eyelid holder in there to open up the eye. Here's the bevacizumab, one syringe for each eye. Little stabilization of the eye and there's the injection. Got to be very precise in where it's injected so as to not cause a cataract or a retinal detachment. Um, one thing that this highlights here is how important it is for both sides to get together and find common ground and set benchmarks and, and uh, how they engage in this to come to a solution uh, and how important the public has been in this with supporters of stream access by being involved in it. That's made a really significant difference. W one final comment on this. Here, here is one way of looking at this issue, and it seems pretty simple, um, but not that easy to solve. The idea is these bridges, uh, th these fences that landlords have to control livestock, the easiest way to do that at a bridge is to build your friend bridge or fence to the bridge abutment. Uh, in doing that, that's illegal as an encroachment on the right-of-way. On the other hand, if you follow uh, the road right-of-way and go straight across the stream, you've got a fence now that's probably going to get blown out every spring runoff and one that's a real hazard uh, to recreationists in floating. So this is a story that Marcus pointed out became a win-win situation here after a lot of work. And sometimes these things just need that work and cooperation. Hey guys, welcome back. Um, let's talk about some movies that are coming out. Hey, you guys like movies? I like movies. But sometimes movies get to be a little bit too much like movies. So here is the movies about movies talking about pre-critic. Uh, but of course, I do wonder if Ryan Reynolds would actually kill people just to promote as a promotional stunt for Deadpool. A question on my mind since I started writing this sentence, um, not the previous one. Um, I have kids who uh, like the idea of breaking the fourth wall, uh, but maybe they should get in the news broadcast because that's basically... Uh, they're constantly breaking the fourth wall since they're constantly talking to the audience. Um, so, um, wait, wait. I need to be stopped. Okay. Anyways, this is uh, watch this inconsistent movie about a wise tracking gun for hire turned superhero in the sequel that proves that the heart wants what the heart wants. Up next, we got, let me guess. So, this is Book Club. It follows an exclusive group of women who read books as a facade only to hide their illegal operations. But then again, this could also be a movie about an actual book club in the same vein of movies like Steel Magnolias. Uh, well, get ready for a group of older women in this movie. Wait, maybe one of their friends who started the book club dies, but then leads them on a kind of like a scavenger hunt with a book they must read, which gives them cryptic clues to uh, One-Eyed Willie's treasure. Think about it. Up next, we got another movie. It's kind of like Miss Congeniality meets Best in Show times Cats and Dogs 2, The Rise of Pussy Galore. It's basically that, but if all was a Rottweil, police dog um, goes undercover at a dog show much like Miss Congeniality. So it must put up, but also while it does this, it must put up with other talking dogs that are uptight, pretty dumb, you know, like pretty dumb, like pretty hyphen dumb, not like very dumb. So anyways, this movie uh, is probably something that you need to find like a missing uh, diamond because uh, if this actually made sense that a dog would be undercover at a dog show, it would actually, in reality, they'd be looking for drugs because uh, a lot of times that's what drugs, uh, dogs are used for is drugs and basically uh, running down people and biting them. Um, but it's a good excuse to, uh, for parents to bring their kids to this movie while they see Deadpool 2. But of course, uh, even worse, parents would actually bring their kids to uh, Deadpool 2, which most likely will happen because a lot of the kids in my after-school programs go 
to a movies like Deadpool. So um, enough of Deadpool. Here's another movie by those kids who love Deadpool and are way too young to watch Deadpool. So here's Flagship Friday, Steamed Hams. Oh, Superintendent Chalmers, come on in. I hope you're ready for an unforgettable luncheon. Sure. Ah, my roast is ruined. But what if I were to purchase fast food and disguise it as my own cooking? Delightly devilish, Seymour. Uh, what are you doing? Uh, I'm just, um, stretching my legs. Uh, exercise, you know? Would you care to join me? No. Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, here are the steamed hams I have prepared for you. There's nothing there. Oh, sorry, I meant steamed hams. Hams. Silly me. Do you need help? Upstate New York. What about upstate New York? It's an Albany expression. I'm calling somebody. I'm, um, I have to, I have to, uh, excuse me for a second. Hello, bullies? I'm being held back against my will. Yeah, bye. <laughs> What is that? Aurora Borealis. No, mother, it's just Aurora Borealis. Ah, Superintendent Chalmers, I hope you're ready for an unforgettable luncheon. Huh? Oh, let me go get the steamed clams. Egad, my, st my roast is ruined. But what if I were to purchase fast food and disguise it as my own cooking? Delightly um, devilish, Seymour. Uh, uh, janitor! Janitor! What's going on in here? I am just stretching my calves. Isometric exercise. Care to join me? Ugh, whatever. I hope you are ready for some mouth-watering steamed eggs. Upstate New York. It's an Albany expression. What was that about? No, mother. Hmm? It's just Aurora Borealis. That wasn't weird at all. Totally. Larkin hasn't been the same since he got YouTube Red. What's the point of YouTube Red? You don't have to watch commercials. Oh! Superintendent Chalmers, I hope you're ready for an unforgettable luncheon. Um, I'm just going to, you know, just, yeah. Fast food, EGAD's luncheon. Mother, it's just my steamed hams. Smash me, see I'm such a me. Chalmers, Chalmers, Chalm, 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 Aurora hams. 
Fast food. No, mother! It's just Aurora Borealis. And it's meme, not Mimi. Anyways, let's talk about some things that are happening within this city of Missoula. The one we're in. If you're not in here, then you won't understand what I'm talking about. Not that you do right now, anyways. Okay, Healthy Relationships Project is in conjunction with Make Your Move spoke in the committee meeting of public safety and health. Chantel um, uh, Gaynor, Director of Relationship Violence Services, talks about trends in Missoula County. And in 2016, we were number two in both of those categories, uh, which is not exactly a great place to be. Uh, 2016, we were continuing to see an uptick of, in reports that was related to the Department of Justice investigation. So as the community had more conversations about these issues, more and more people came forward to talk about them. Um, and, you know, only over time will we see if that trend continues. For the Crime Victim Advocate Program, in FY17, we saw 1,758 people. Um, and again, because there's some lag time in those numbers, uh, just looking in the last quarter, so January to March of this year, we saw 410 clients, which is averaging about 137 a month. Um, All right, so that's kind of seeing uh, where we're at now in the Missoula County area of how many people actually visit uh, crime victim av advocates to seek out help for any kind of uh, sexually uh, related assaults and crimes. Um, there's still many more that they're trying to um, look at. So um, the amount of folks coming out of Missoula are making up half the visits. Um, uh, they showed a pie graph and about half the visits are out of Missoula County, uh, a trend that has changed over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, domestic violence can encompass many avenues because the more specific sexual assaults are uh, better the better CVA can help with dealing with problem partners or potential threats to life and liberty um, with uh, stalking, all sorts of things in terms of that, because there's a difference between a um, person that you're with and have kids with. There's person that someone that you've been dating for a short amount of time. And then there's somebody that you have absolutely no contact with that has been following you. So that's that the crime victim advocates really helps out with those specific things and they can help you if you have a specific problem with that. Uh, Jenny Daniel with Just Response Coordinator talks about building healthy relationships with victims um, t and he talks about and she talks about some of the needs that they need to do in terms of educating um, different types of people who interact with folks that we are seeing a need for the people that are responding on the ground, the patrol, the CVA, um, civil advocates, SANE nurses, those folks, CPS workers, they are not, they're missing out on the training. It seems like training is available for the people that are able to come to the meetings and those folks are really responding and so um, we recently held five of us got together and um, coordinated a training f two days same training uh, for all the sheriff patrol and so we're hoping to get that going in the other departments and really trying to reach out to the people that are really busy responding um, and one of the uh, many things that they're also doing as well is training um, people in the community like people uh, that work for uh, the Missoulian and people who work for 
newspapers that interview uh, victims of sexual assault as well and work on sensitivity training towards asking questions. Um, the police department has done 50 screens to determine whether or not folks are in danger of domestic violence, and thus far, 90. 3% of the 50 uh, uh, incidents have reported have been categorized as danger. So YWCA has taken um, some of these folks under care. Education has been the key component in both victim and defendants in this way to say they know better as a result of these classes taken. About 80% of the defendants who are supposed to take these classes based on these sexual assault crimes have uh, learned a lot more about this and the reduction has um, been shown. Um, Kelly McGuire, outreach man manager, relationship violence services, talked with their um, with them working with Missoula County uh, Public Schools and how uh, high school students have benefited from um, educational uh, uh, consent um, workshops. So we have seen really big drops in dating violence and sexual violence over the last couple of years. Uh, we can't take total credit for this. Um, it is a statewide and national trend that violence is decreasing. But I will say that our numbers are lower than the statewide average, and that's really exciting, and I think due to all the work that we've been putting in here in Missoula. So reported sexual dating violence decreased by 47% in four years. Reported physical dating violence decreased by 68% in six years, which is a huge, huge drop. And I'm really hoping that we continue to see that um, because we're working really hard to make sure that that continues and continues to decrease. All right. So to learn more information about this, go to the Public Safety and Health uh, Committee meeting on ci.missoula.mt.us. Um, lots of the uh, lots of teens uh, definitely um, come to MCAT. Just on a side note, and have relationships begin and end basically like that. Um, but the overall attempts at educating the kids through discussion is one of the many. Uh, proactive things relationship violence services make your move campaign and uh, has done and will continue to do in the future let's talk about some land use and planning let's get off this topic i'm going to switch gears uh land use and planning is talking about the mcmansion um, potential issue that may occur within the university district uh there's a guest that showed up in public comment of the house in question so i'll get to that in a, in a bit but here's gwen jones a uh, city council member who talks about the things that have resulted in city's involvement with uh, the overall update with their kind of like design standards for the university neighborhood. This is, this is not a one house situation so I wanted to dispel that at the very beginning. As for a triggering event, sometimes there's a triggering event. That's how government works. That's The Verizon store has triggered our design excellence standards. There may have been a triggering event in the U District, but there is a history of this being an issue. And frankly, I talked to many, not only did I receive 40 to 50 emails, but I talked to many people who are not involved with the University District Neighborhood Council or the Homeowners Association. I talked to a lot of people before pursuing this to make sure that there was broad support and this wasn't just one sector of people who were being loud. So I wanted you to have that background. All right. So um, according to uh, the owner of the property that, that was the inciting triggering event, uh, Laura Timlow, the resident of the house uh, just next to uh, – the Bonner Park uh, responds to uh, the communication that has been done towards her and within the uh, community. He asked, what is the total population of the University District? How many people want to see a zoning change? And Tom, um, which is also, he's been very great in getting numbers to me and helping me understand the scope of this. He said there are 1,100 dwelling units, uh, which equates to about 2,400 people. And of those, 150 wanted to see change to the zoning code. So that's about 5%, 5% based on these numbers that want to see change. And again, I have to pause and I have to ask the question um, because I appreciate this process. I appreciate people getting involved and shaping a neighborhood they want. But is this a vocal minority? Is it a majority? I feel uh, that we don't know, and again, I, I think at the root of that is how a questionnaire was distributed or, again, notification of it um, for all in that district to get involved if they so choose. Uh, I didn't even know about it. In fact, I had a reporter from the Independent contact me saying, what are your thoughts on the questionnaire? And I was like, what? So I respectfully ask 
this council to consider that something like 5%, is that truly a mandate? Is that a mandate to change the zoning in this way? All right, and so that was um, uh, Ms. Timlo with uh, the response to uh, some of the concerns that she has in regards to uh, designing, how design standards should be within um, home construction and building your own home. But of course, uh, regardless of how many people support or are against certain programs, um, a lot of times with the city of Missoula, they have war representatives that represent the ward. And a lot of times they, uh, the ward has a tendency to look within the best interest and also look at design standards as in general, since that seems to be the biggest trend here in the city of Missoula is how Missoula grows and the design standards and the overall look of how they want Missoula to be. Um, it doesn't take, um, a, it's not, it's usually not down to a, a majority of people who vote for these kind of design standards. The city council are uh, a small portion of representing of the people that vote on this kind of stuff for zoning standards. And they're going to be working with their, uh, title 20 zoning standard, which recently just got updated. And they're going to use that kind of like as an overlay, which they can, which is the word that they use in the city council to talk about this as well. Here's Stacey Anderson. And uh, she's, uh, she basically kind of reflects on this as well. I think that a lot of us who are new on council sometimes feel like, you know, the pace of city government in some instances is quick. And I think that the time that was taken and the care to make sure that all sides were considered and this was as thoughtful as it could be is important. And I think that, um, you know, Preserving the special sauce that is Missoula takes a lot of work, and I think that this is one aspect of it. And I also think that we need to be responsive to neighborhoods. You know, there was a design standard or, you know, complete streets project in my ward that called for bike lanes and the neighborhood said that was not appropriate and the council representatives brought that forward and it was changed and so I think it's really important to listen to the ward reps from these. All right so that's kind of uh, an example of some of the things that uh, can happen a lot of times when, when the city thinks that something may be a good idea it's always appropriate for people in the community to come forth and be like this is why I think this is a bad idea. Um, not for personal reasons, but for practical reasons. So anyways, but also personal reasons also factor in, into a lot of why a lot of people say a lot of different things. So anyways, I'm going to kind of move on from there. Uh, the city did this. is They're going to be um, setting up public hearings, and it, and it will be set up on Monday evening, not saying that this is going to be voted on in the future as well. It's just going to be put on the Monday's consent agenda to be Basically, it's going to be voted on whether or not when, when they're going to be talking about it. So it's going to be voted on whether or not. Yeah, so that's it, it's, it's, it's pretty convoluted. But anyways, even more con convoluted is admin and finance. Um, so $3.6 million are going towards an art park and police evidence facility off Caitlin Street, $400,000 to the art park, and $3.2 million to the police evidence facility. Um, many... Uh, uh, City Council John DeBari is confused about the funding, uh, the art park, um, with the police evidence uh, facility. Kind of seems like it's kind of like a kind of a weird mesh up um, with art and the police. Why can't they kind of do it separately? So this is uh, his kind of question behind it. You know, John raises an excellent point. We wrestled with this. Hold on one second. I just got to find the right quote. Did I get it? Oh. Got to go back to it. Sorry about that. Let me just try to find it again. Okay, here's John DeBar. That finance, that difference, does that make sense? I mean, we're, we're stuck with a bill that we never anticipated, and now we're financing it for 20 years, and that bill is going to be even more as a result of the financing. And, uh, and so if there are legitimate expenses, that makes sense to um, to bond for regarding the art park you know maybe that's just fine but I, at least that's my thinking around this i don't know what other folks think or what what is even in the realm of the possible here in terms of trying to split the baby as it were all right so the funding towards the art park is the one that's going to be considered within the loan the art park's already done that's the thing this is the money that's owed 
to the construction of the art park, and this is not for any future construction on the art park. So somebody's got to get paid for the um, construction that the Missoula Museum, uh, Adventure Cycling, and the City of Missoula team up has worked on. So with this, the City of Missoula um, and uh, Dale Bickle explains why they need uh, for, to, for a tacked on budget to increase the overall total. But if we didn't include the art park, the city would have to get money from uh, the general fund. So the whole idea is that this is a loan along with the police evidence facility. It's not like you can defund the park that already exists. And that's kind of what the theme of it was. And Heidi West asked if the city can work on these future projects that require additional funds in the future so the city is not left with the tap. So here is, uh, let's see, here's Brian Von Losberg with the last quote that I have from Admin and Finance. Recognizing that, so for me, it's more a standpoint of uh, it's more an issue of um, making sure that we don't engage in projects in such a way where we lack uh, the the proper sort of organization and roles and responsibilities and clear accounting uh, of how we do that. Um, that's solely my take on it. So I think. All right. So that was um, John, uh, that was um, Brian Van Losberg with that um, there's much uh, love towards the art park in this community meeting and it's understandable when you have a proposal that the city is going to help fund on the assurance that the folks who proposed the art park would pay their share of what they'd say that they try to raise um, and of course I can kind of see why the city is hesitant towards the max wave project now since they were just last week the motion carries and will continue through the committee report for Monday uh, parks and conservation talk about the urban forest uh, forest management implementation uh, Chris Boza city forester and Murray Anderson She's the urban forester specialist. They talk um, at this meeting and give an update exactly what's going on with the urban forest. And here's Chris Boza talks about the timelines to tree removal and the risks associated uh, associated with that. So if uh, a, a citizen called in with a request for service, uh, it would typically take us three to three and a half years to get out there. And uh, because we've had the two crews running various programs, we've brought that dwell time down to six to eight months. So it's a significant reduction in the dwell time from uh, requests for service to when we actually can do that. <coughs> Next is the timely removal of high-risk trees. Uh, when we say risk, that is the potential of a tree to cause damage, injury, or death. And so trees that are high risk have the highest potential to cause inju uh, damage, injury, or death. And because we've been able to manipulate where our crews go, we can address those high-risk trees on a, uh, on a very timely basis. And but um, for a lot of the city, the timely basis is not quite enough because um, Chris uh, says that the trees are dying faster than they are being replaced. So here he is once again. Uh, there's competition for staff time, and that's the timely snow removal. And uh, so when we talk about that timely snow removal, we've added a number of areas, number of miles of trails that have to be uh, plowed, but the staffing hasn't kept up with that. And so we've supplemented that with the uh, urban forestry staff in the wintertime. However, the uh, dormant season is optimal pruning time. And uh, so when we'd like to have uh, the majority of our crews out pruning trees, they're plowing snow. And that, that's that double-edged sword that I, uh, that, that I had talked about earlier. All right. So... Uh uh, Chris Boza, um, basically during this meeting, the first half of the meeting, because I kind of skipped way ahead, is basically talks about the history of the urban forestry. And after World War II, uh, a lot of trees were planted in the Missoula area, but most of those trees had a lifespan of 40 to 60 years. So it's been 70 plus years since World War II happened in 45. So a lot of these trees are high risk and they're not getting... Um, cut down or removed because it takes uh, quite some time to remove some of these trees because they have to remove it root and all. Um, 450 trees were removed, but they still got, they were still behind 300 trees just last year. The rate of removal and replacement and pruning is falling behind the needs. Even trees and boulevards are not being watered, and there are more and more boulevards being proposed in the downtown area than there are being maintained. Um, Jordan Hess ta asks about the challenges and Chris Boda gives uh, a, a nice little metaphor about um, the urban forest. 
Um, the loss of tree planting sites, uh, primarily due to utility installations, or um, can you talk a little bit about that as a, that that challenge and, and what what progress, if any, we might be making on that? Um, just to, just to comment about the the calm exterior. Um, if you put a frog in a pot and you slowly turn up the heat, uh, you have frog legs. But if you throw the uh, the frog into a pot of hot water, it'll jump out. And that and that's kind of what we have here because we see the urban forest, but we're slowly seeing it decline, and so we don't see that sense of urgency. All right. In so in in terms of the utility. Sorry about that. Uh, so that's basically kind of like the, the way the urban forest is right now. And this was an update to what's happening in the or urban forest. Uh, Chris Boza, you can contact him um, via the website at ci.missoula.mt.us. It goes to this wonderful website. All you got to do is click in urban forest. There, in, in urban forestry, urban forest. Um, maybe there's a uh, I don't know. I'll just go to urban forester. And you can contact these, uh, let's see, Urban Forester, Referral, blah, blah, blah. See, you can contact them. It's 552-6270. You can also uh, email them. So, again, that number is 552-6270. Uh, so, you, if you want to request a tree to be removed in your area, if you're part of the Urban Forest. So, basically, Urban Forest is downtown, city limits, and the trees. And a lot of times the trees in the boulevards, which are more considered in the public right of way. So uh, he kind of explains uh, 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 just the different kinds of things that are happening inside the city as well. But once again, you can go to ci.missoula.mt.us. But if you want to find out more information about MCAT, you can go to MCAT.org. MCAT.org, everything that you can see on the city's website, you can see on here. We do all of our city council meetings, and we put it on channel 189, 190. Sorry about that. Um, channel 190 is the website, is the link that will send you to this page. Just give it a couple seconds. Montana Internet slow. Boom. And you get all the most recent meetings with city council meeting, Bonner Milltown. You got Missoula. You got Missoula Live, all these wonderful things there as well. But I just want to let you guys know is that uh, um, Animation Camp number two is almost full, but we still have plenty of room in Animation Camp one. Time Traveler's Camp is still open. We have about four slots left in our zombie camp. There's only four camps MCAT's offering this year. Last year, we I think we offered six. This year is four, and they're mostly going to be happening in July. Uh, with the exception of the last uh, first animation camp in the last week of June, the last full week. So you guys can check that out. You can go to MCAT.org. You can click on the picture. You can click on summer camps. You can go on more, register for summer camps. There's millions of different ways to do this online as well, just as much as doing our online survey. So online survey, you can take the survey. Click here, click there, click it pretty much anywhere that says anything to do with the survey. We are looking for your feedback about how you feel about the future of public access television. And if, even if you don't have charter cable, we want to hear from you. you if you're a Missoulian, a Missoula resident, that's all we want to know is we want to hear from you about charter cable and also how you feel about the future of MCAT since we'll be moving into the new library, hopefully by 2020. Okay, I think that pretty much does it um, in terms of that. Let me talk about some events that are kicking off for your Friday. Uh, today, if you're interested in your kid doing some indoor sports fun, um, Missoula Indoor Sports Arena, Roots Acres Sports Center, and Mismo Gymnastics are all your indoor sports and fun activities for kids who want to just do some tumbling in a safe uh, padded r environment with trampolines and more. And this is for usually kids' uh, birth to five years of age, just like the uh, Missoula Public Library's Tiny Tales and Story Time that start at 10.30 a.m. at the Missoula Public Library. Spectrum Discovery Center is doing astronomy from 11 to 5, um, and they're going to be learning about astronomy. Each uh, day is a new uh, kind of uh, work, um, a, a new kind of uh, science experiment. It's all hands-on learning for kids who are interested in, in, in learning about science and the natural world. Um, watercolor and yarns at Missoula Public Library starting at t noon today. If you are a watercolor, great. If you want to do some um, making your own clothing or making a scarf or making a nice little beanie for a uh, family member, it's a good time to learn about this at Missoula Public Library starting at noon. Or if you just want to hang out and play some board games and cribbage or bridge, you can go to Missoula Senior Center at 1230. 
Um, family fun time at the Y is starting at 3.30 p.m. And this is a, a group activity for your family. It's $22, $22 per family um, without a membership. But of course, uh, it's fun time at the Y provides an indoor all weather place where parents are welcome to join in the fun. Teen Riders Group is happening at 3.30 p.m. at the Missoula Public Library this afternoon. Uh, Family Friendly Friday at the Top Hat from 6 to 9 p.m. And I'm just going to kind of breeze through that as well. But of course, today at the Roxy Theater, tonight, more likely, um, starting at 6 p.m., it's Endangered Species Day Film Festival. There's a lot of things happening at the Roxy tonight, and this is one of the things. So there is the Firefox Guardian, which is a 14-minute uh, documentary about a f small village in Nepal. A native woman steps up a as, I as an unconventional warrior to change the unfortunate fate of the red pandas in her community forest. The mysteries of the Nar Narulu sea turtles in remote western Australia, scientists attach satellite trackers to the backs of 10 females for their first time to plot their top secret routes. Um, and you get to learn about that in the mystery of the sea turtles. Um, Zen, uh, Japanese last dugon, dugons. Um, so basically, it's, uh, it's a dugon is closely related to our manatees in the Everglades. And you get to learn about this endangered species. And it's called Japan's last dugons. Um, Africa's Last Wolf, uh, there's going to be a 15-minute documentary about Megedi, um, and the roots of Africa are home to the world's last Ethiopian wolves. And of course, on a side note, all American wolves, as we know, all the uh, Montana native wolves as that, w that we know are extinct, and most of the wolves that are now living here are imports from Canada. That's just a little bit of trivia for you guys as well. Uh, but uh, shows happening at the Roxy. It's going to be a theater, a comedy show happening at the Roxy at 7.30 p.m. tonight. It's happening pretty much all weekend long. After suffering a major loss while he was on a cross-country bike trip, 21-year-old Leo seeks solace from his feisty 91-year-old grandmother, Vera, in her West Village apartment. Over the course of a single month, this unlikely roommate, these unlikely roommates infuriate, bewilder, and ultimately reach each other. 4,000 miles looks at how two outsiders find their way in today's world. I have another art clip for you guys, and then I'll get to Saturday events after this. So here is an, another art clip, which is going to be at the Clay Studio until May 25th. So stay with me. <laughs> in the city of Missoula for your Saturday. Besides the farmer's market happening from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m., people's market, farmer's market, and the Clark Fork River market all happening in the downtown area. You can't, meal, you can't miss it. Bike for Shelter is kicking off the Washington Children's Shelter fundraiser for kids who may be dealing with guardian troubles and need shelter to help them through difficult times. Community, co community Medical hosts this, and Montana Real Link sponsors it from 9 to 1 p.m. Missoula, in, uh, Missoula International School is doing a chess tournament at 9.30 at their location, and this is for grades K-12 through to enjoy and learn about chess and also play in a chess tournament. Um, rugby, Megafest is this weekend, so uh, be careful. <laughs> Those guys like to party hard and um, uh, 
play hard in this rugby tournament that's happening all week long where they invite countries from all over the world to come on down to Missoula, Montana to play rugby and go out to the uh, – basically they're going to have a Maggot, Maggot Fest party happening tonight as well. So you may want to avoid downtown Missoula this weekend as well, just so you know. I'm going to talk – whisper really loud. Okay, Walk MS, uh, McCormick Park is doing a uh, walk for people uh, with MS and for family members who want to support those who have multiple sclerosis. Um, form a team and walk alone or walk alone to find a cure for MS. And this is happening at 9.30 at McCormick Park. Creative Journals covers, um, Missoula Public Library hosts a um, Creative Journal covers where you get to basically make your own journal covers, and this happens from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Women's Navigating with Map and Compass class, Greeno Park Pavilion. If you are feeling empowered when when you're in the backcountry by knowing exactly where you are and where you're going to go by using a map and compass, this is a women's navigating map and compass course starting at noon tomorrow. Perk Up Your Park, Hellgate Lions Park is looking for community cleanup uh, volunteers to help out with Hellgate Lion Park, which is 1305 Hillung, West Riverside on Saturday from 1 to 5 p.m. Rain day, um, and also is going to be from... Um, on the next day from 1 to 5, it's going to be a two-day event happening at Hellgate Lions Park. MCAT's last Saturday drop-ins are happening uh, tomorrow at 1, and it goes from 1 to 5. And if you've had a kid to our Saturday drop-ins, they'll get a disc out of MCAT, and the discs are available here at MCAT. All they got to do is come in. I'll give a disc to the kid who has done the Saturday drop-in. Over two hours of stop animation and video creativity over the last couple months of kids working really hard. Uh, gallery talk with Corin Claremont, the two-headed arrow. I have about two, less than two minutes left in collaboration with the second annual Indigenous Film Festival, uh, which is happening this weekend as well. Actually starts today and goes on until tonight. So it's from five to 10, and then again, mostly all day tomorrow at the Missoula Children's Theater Center for Performing Arts. Living Art, light show. So Living Art of Montana is hosting their annual fundraising show um, where they in the beautiful Wilma Theater. And this event includes dinner, the lamp lady, and the live, au live art auction happening at the Wilma at 5.30 p.m. tomorrow night. Vintage sewing night. The last thing I got to say is that Downtown Dance Collective is hosting a vintage swing night. If you don't have a partner, doesn't matter. Singles are perfectly welcome and you do some swing dancing. So no partners are needed, but trust is. So Without further ado, I just want to wrap up my show, and I want to thank you guys for joining me this wonderful morning. Um, Memorial Day weekend is next weekend, and Memorial Day ceremonies is happening on Monday, May 28th. Susan Campbell will know. Thanks again for joining me this morning on Wake Up Missoula, and thank you for joining me on Wake Up Missoula. I will see you next Wednesday. Um, see you later. Mm -hmm.